Welcome to another chilling episode of True Crime Cases. In an eastern suburb of Christchurch, New Zealand, a seemingly ordinary house hides a dark and twisted secret. The crime committed within was so sickening and depraved that even investigators and psychologists do not fully understand the rationale behind it. This is the story of what happened inside that house. But before we begin, please smash that like and subscribe button. Your support means a lot. Disappearance On September 26, 2008, a cool Thursday morning, the Bower Tavern in Christchurch is alive with chatter. The clinking of glasses and distant laughter fills the air. A 28-year-old beautiful woman, Tisha Lori, steps out of the front door to return home after spending some quality time with her grandfather. The two are very close, and she is looking forward to his birthday celebration tomorrow. She doesn't usually get to spend much time with him, but recently, she moved in because she wants to take a break from her 48-year-old boyfriend and reflect on some issues they have been having together. She has no idea that this is the last time she will ever see him or anyone else. Tisha does not show up for her grandfather's birthday celebration the next day. Her mother, Tanya, is troubled by her daughter's absence and finds it very unusual. Her first thought is that Tisha is with her boyfriend and she decides to give her some space. However, when she contacts Tisha's boyfriend the following day, she is alarmed to learn that he hasn't seen or heard from Tisha for days. Panic now sets in, prompting the family to contact the police and report Tisha missing. October 2, 2008, a week after Tisha's mysterious disappearance, Detective Senior Sergeant Virginia Labaz makes a public plea for information. The investigation intensifies, with police searching Tisha's grandfather's house and all the places she frequented. By October 7th, the search expands to the Avon River, a scenic and peaceful spot that Tisha would have taken home from the tavern. As the police scour the riverbank in the water, the family distributes 1,200 flyers, hoping to find a clue or a witness. Tisha's sister, Liang, reveals the family's emotional turmoil. Despite the involvement of 35 officers and extensive searches, the case remains a baffling mystery. As the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, the hope of finding Tisha alive fades away. The next year, on June 11, 2009, a $20,000 reward is offered for information leading to Tisha's whereabouts. The desperate plea of Detective Labas is echoed at a news conference. Tisha was last seen on September 26, 2008. Someone has the key to this mystery, and we need your help. One year later, in the aftermath of Tisha Lurie's disappearance, an unsettling mystery unfolded just two houses away from where she was staying. Jason Somerville, a resident in the vicinity, walked into the police station to report his wife gone. When he reported his wife missing, he told the police she had a history of depression addiction, and self-harm. Hinting that she may have committed suicide, he said she left without her keys, handbag, cell phone, and bank cards. He returned a few days later and told the police that someone had placed his wife's prescription glasses and wedding ring in their letterbox. The twist. The detectives sat down with Jason, who had piqued their interest, and were unprepared by what they were about to learn. For reasons unknown, Jason confessed to killing his wife, Rebecca. Adding further shock, he also confessed to killing Tisha the previous year. No one truly knows why he confessed without much probing from the detective. Maybe he had hoped to get the $20,000 reward for Tisha's whereabouts, or maybe the guilt was too much for him to bear. September 25th, 2008, Jason said he was chopping wood outside his home and went inside to get a drink. When he heard a knock on the door, it was Tisha Lori, his neighbor from two doors down. He recalls she was wearing a Chicago Bulls jacket and jeans. He allowed her into his house, and according to him, Tisha wandered around the lower floor looking for things before going upstairs. She played with the computer, looked at a filing cabinet. I asked her to leave. Jason said he was annoyed with her, and despite him ordering her to leave, 
she refused to. At this point, he admits getting very angry and pushed her down the stairs. She didn't lose her footing, and he put his hands around her neck. He said, I grabbed her and held on to her. At some point, I had her against the wall. She was fighting me. I held on to her until she stopped fighting. I knew this person was a goner because of how long I had held her. He admitted to strangling Tisha to death with his bare hands. It was so violent that he mentioned he noticed a good amount of blood was coming out of her face. He then left her body there and went to fetch a pair of his wife's underwear. Upon returning, he stuffed it down her throat. What happened next is truly sickening. He removed her jeans and underwear and had sex with her lifeless body. Jason left the house that afternoon to attend his Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Upon returning an hour later, he realized his wife would be back at 3 p.m. He proceeded to open a hatch below his basement, which exposed an area below the foundations of his house that has dirt and soft ground. He then dragged Tisha's half-naked body and dropped it in the now open hole. He dropped down, dug a shallow grave with his hands and a floorboard, covered Tisha's body in dirt before pulling himself back up and putting the hatch back on. Jason then cleaned up the area as much as he could. Once his wife, Rebecca, returned, they went about their day as usual, carrying out some domestic chores and went to bed, as if it was a day like any other. His wife, completely unaware of the corpse, just a few feet below their bedroom. The next day, Rebecca left the house in the morning to attend a meeting. Jason seized this opportunity to descend into the opening, uncover Tish's body, and violate her corpse again. Tish's body, now in early stages of decomposition, was showing signs of rigor mortis, but Jason wasn't bothered. He was now a full-fledged necrophile, taking a moment to say that this author was very disturbed when he learned of this fact. This video aims to expose the twisted mind of Jason Somerville. Jason told the police his motive for attacking Tisha was due to the anger he felt from her refusal to leave his residence despite his commands. In the months following, Jason and Rebecca Chamberlain carried on with their lives as usual. During this time, it was reported Jason would discuss Tisha's disappearance with their neighbors and said, what if they've got her locked in a dungeon and they are having sex with her, as if he is hinting at his deranged fantasy. It's unclear if he violated Tisha's body again, because he only admitted to doing it twice. It seemed Jason's wife, Rebecca, never suspected something sinister in their home, and it appears there was no detectable odor of a decaying corpse, despite months of her body being there. This is because there was so much other filth and smells around the house that it masked the putrid smell of decomposition but more on that later. Sadly, Rebecca never learned the truth, as Jason also confessed to killing her. Rebecca and Jason Somerville's Rocky Relationship Jason and Rebecca Sarah Chamberlain met in the early 2000s. Rebecca had a young son at the time from a previous relationship. In 2003, they got married at Taupo Baptist Church and a few years later had two daughters together. Financially, they were struggling Jason worked stocking trolleys at a supermarket, and Rebecca worked as a cleaner in a fast food restaurant. In 2005, they had to sell their house and downsize to a smaller flat to ease their financial burden. According to the person who purchased their property, Jason was a very jittery, anxious person, and the home was filthy and damaged, with walls and doors that looked like they had been kicked in or hit with a hammer. There were also feces on the carpet, it could hardly be called a home. In 2010, an article would be published stating a neighbor of the Somervilles had described overhearing Jason speak to his wife and kids in a brutally disgusting manner. He said, He was a bloody mongrel. I heard him one day yelling abuse at his kids. I wouldn't speak to my dogs like that. And I told him if I heard him speak like that again, I would drop him on the spot. He treated his wife and kids like shit. She seemed petrified of him. He seemed in complete control over her, big mouth, no guts. Around late 2005, they took custody of Jason and Rebecca's children. The exact reasons for why are unclear, 
but there are speculations this is due to the physical abuse suffered by Jason's oldest child, including hearsay that Jason may have hanged the oldest child from the shower rail. One thing is clear, it was not an ideal home to raise children, and both parents were substance abusers. The Tapo Baptist Church community was handed custody and care of the children. It was not until around 2007 that Jason and Rebecca moved to Christchurch into what is now known as the infamous House of Horrors. Jason was a laborer at his father's farm and was learning carpentry on the side. He was also doing a lot of renovations in their house. However, despite the seemingly improved situation, they informed them they were still not deemed fit to have returned custody of their children. Hearing this news, Rebecca's substance and painkiller addiction only got worse. She even began self-harming by cutting herself and had several trips to the emergency psychiatric care. She decided to seek help and eventually got sober and stopped self-harming. Working with the family lawyer, they again attempted to regain custody of their children. Remarks from their lawyer, Peter Burns, were praising Rebecca, but they thought Jason was a very nervous, edgy person and rather odd. He said, they sent at least 10 applications to court regarding custody and she wrote them all. They were just brilliant. You would think that a lawyer wrote them. She was very intelligent. She had cleaned herself up and just wanted to be a mom. Despite all these attempts, they were unable to get custody of their children back. Rebecca's murder. Fast forward almost a year from Tish's demise. It was a usual Sunday morning. Jason Somerville and his wife of six years, Rebecca Chamberlain, were asleep in their bed upstairs at their house. Jason woke up first and initiated sex with Rebecca. She said no. Jason tried once again, but the answer was the same. This interaction continued several times before Jason, now frustrated, left the bedroom to go downstairs and fix himself a cup of coffee. Soon after he returned to the bedroom and attempted to have sex with his wife again, she refused once more, saying she wasn't in the mood. According to Jason, this made him feel rejected and very angry. He said, I grabbed her by the throat and held onto her. I locked her in a headlock. I snapped. Rebecca struggled, but Jason only tightened his headlock in response. He said, when she finally gave up, I let go. I honestly thought she was going to be fine when I let go of her. He then left his wife unconscious in the bedroom and went to relieve himself in the toilet. After returning to the bedroom, he was surprised to see Rebecca still unmoving. He checked for a pulse on her neck, but couldn't detect one. Instead of trying to revive her, he did the opposite. He placed his hands firmly on her neck making sure to apply firm downward pressure from his fingers and thumb on her arteries. This ensured she would never regain consciousness. He had obliterated all hope of reviving her. He had killed once again, this time his own wife, and ensured she stay dead. Jason said, it's the first time I've actually had someone die after I've let them go after doing that. I don't understand why the hell she died. I mean, shit, when you let someone go they're supposed to live man. And then I initially tried to cover my tracks. It seemed Jason's only concern was himself and didn't care if his wife lived or died. In fact, he made sure she wouldn't survive after he brutally reacted to her refusals to have sex with him. Then he stuffed her panties down her throat and proceeded to have sex with her body. Deja vu for what he had done to Tisha less than a year ago. Once he was done, he said, Quote, I kissed her on the forehead and said goodbye to her. I panicked. I dragged her off the bed, dragged her downstairs. I was more worried about the trouble I would get into. And it was crazy. Like Tisha, he dug a shallow grave below his house and covered Rebecca's corpse with dirt, burying her next to Tisha. According to the police, Jason Somerville exhibited moments of remorse expressing bewilderment at his own actions during the interview. In his own words, I don't understand. That's two lives I know I shouldn't have taken. I honestly don't understand it cause it goes against each, everything I've been taught. September 7, 2009. After the confession, 
The New Zealand police went to the property to dug up Tisha Laurie and Rebecca Chamberlain's body that night. They had informed Tisha and Rebecca's family. Tisha, who was of Maori origin, had family and members of the community perform the haka, a dance likely to honor and respect her soul. Jason caused this. But who was Jason Somerville? Let's try to unravel his past and uncover the forces that may have propelled him towards the abyss of such unspeakable crimes. Jason Paul Somerville was born on January 20, 1976, in Christchurch, the eldest of four children to Graham and Rosemary Somerville. Despite his family's initial stability, his parents divorced in 1989 when Jason was 13 leading him to move with his mother and siblings to Tapo for a fresh start. However, financial struggles persisted despite Rosemary's involvement in the Mormon church. In Tapo, Jason attended school but faced difficulties. He was illiterate and perceived as slow by his peers, enduring bullying due to his mother's mental illness and his own struggles. His reactions to bullying sometimes turned violent. He was described as an oddball and a loner. Bullied at school, he would sometimes retaliate and go for the throat of his attackers. As a 14-year-old boy, he started stealing women's underwear from their hanging laundry. He crept around at night, peeping in windows. In his caravan, he used to masturbate while watching women getting undressed through his binoculars. Leaving school in the early 1990s, Jason relied on odd jobs and government support. Despite his challenges, he managed to purchase property where he lived throughout the 1990s. For his behavior, he received warnings from a local cop, and he also committed burglaries, but got away without charges. He was prescribed Tegretol, an anticonvulsant medication for epilepsy, which he said also helped control this quote mood swings. Jason was once again warned to stop stalking women, but was still not charged. Somerville never had a criminal record, he had only a minor driving violation, and had largely flown under the radar. It seems he was largely ignored by society and the police, and any developmental issues he may have had were allowed to fester and grow, leading him to later commit the heinous actions against Tisha and his own wife. Sentencing The official sentencing for these heinous crimes took place on January 29, 2010. As Justice Lester Chisholm entered the courtroom, a hushed anticipation fell over the gallery. Jason Somerville stood before him, his demeanor betraying no hint of emotion. The air was thick with tension as Justice Chisholm began his sentencing remarks, meticulously outlining the heinous crimes committed by Somerville. Justice Chisholm began, his voice grave, quote, Your explanation was that you were angry with Tisha, and as far as I can gather, this was because she would not leave. And you were angry with Rebecca because she refused sex. Despite Somerville's claims of remorse, Justice Chisholm remained unconvinced. According to the probation officer, you displayed no remorse or victim empathy, he stated flatly. The murders that you have committed have left the Lori and Chamberlain families with an irreplaceable loss. Justice Chisholm delivered the final blow. Quote, so, to summarize, you are sentenced to life imprisonment. You must serve a minimum of 23 years. While it was understood that Jason had a difficult start in life, with brain trauma, a head injury, and suffered sexual abuse during his teenage years, it was also noted that according to a psychiatrist and psychologist, none of these had resulted in an identifiable mental disorder. And throughout the case, Jason Somerville showed no remorse or empathy for his victims. The sexual aspect and impulsive nature of his crimes was considered a significant indication of future risk, 
and there was a substantial likelihood of further sexual or violence offenses. All things considered, the judge allowed for a three-year reduction in his sentence due to his guilty plea. It was noted that Somerville remained emotionless all through the sentencing. Somerville's fate was sealed, his punishment a reflection of the gravity of his crimes. Victim Impact Statements In the wake of Somerville's sentencing, the courtroom bore witness to the raw anguish of the victim's families. Tisha Lurie's loved ones stepped forward, their voices trembling with grief and fury as they addressed Somerville directly. You don't deserve to be on this earth, Tisha's younger brother, Jacob, declared, his words ringing with righteous indignation. Their mother, Tanya, voiced her hatred for Somerville, her anguish palpable. I hate him, she spat, her voice choked with tears. I wouldn't wish the emotions this has caused me on my worst enemy. Similar sentiments echoed from Rebecca Chamberlain's family, their pain etched deep into their faces. A poem penned by Rebecca herself served as a poignant reminder of the vibrant life extinguished by Somerville's hands. I am not a mistake. Her words echoed through the courtroom, a testament to her resilience and strength. Through tear-stained eyes, Rebecca's mother and father shared their heartache with the court, their voices trembling with sorrow. I really miss Rebecca and feel lost without her in my life. Her father's words hung heavy in the air, a poignant reminder of the irreplaceable void left in the wake of her senseless death. Conclusion The infamous House of Horrors was purchased by Christchurch City Council, torn down, and a park was erected in its place. It's a part of White Ribbon New Zealand Foundation, a place that offers tools to support men to behave responsibly as adults and as caregivers to influence young men to prevent tragedies like this. The harrowing tale of Tisha Lurie and Rebecca Chamberlain serves as a sobering reminder of the pervasive threat of domestic violence. Despite the warning signs and cries for help, society failed to recognize the danger posed by Jason Somerville until it was too late. The lackluster police investigation and systemic shortcomings underscore the urgent need for reform and greater vigilance in identifying and supporting victims of abuse. By shining a light on this tragic case, we honor the memories of Tisha and Rebecca and reaffirm our commitment to protecting women from harm. Thank you for your continuing support. Please leave your thoughts, comments, and feedback below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications of updates from our channel. Your support empowers us to continue our work and shed light on more cases.